coming up. Foraging for snails to feed the French. Forging cutlery with heavy metal. And fabricating the ultimate kayak. How do they do it? Snail. Scientists see a mollusk. Gardeners see a pest. Frenchmen see lunch. It's believed the Romans brought the habit of eating snails to France, where it certainly caught on. Today they eat over half a billion of them each year. To feed the Gallic appetite, 90% of snails eaten in France are now imported from farmers and foragers across Europe. How do they do it? Northern Turkey. The Black Sea region is the wettest in the country. Annual rainfall levels here average 1,500 millimetres. But some like it wet. Snails do well where it's wet. That's because to get around, they float on a river of slimy mucus. And to make the mucus, they need water. Anyone else hungry? Every year, approximately 66 million snails from this region end up on our plates. Turkey is one of the biggest producers of snails in Europe, but it's an export industry only. The Turks hate snails. <laughs> Turkish entrepreneur Sadiq Ayanoglu produces a third of all snails annually exported from Turkey. It's fair to say he's a massive fan of mollusks. Salyangoz benim hayatımda ailemden sonra ikinci gelen bir olaydır. And Sadiq doesn't work alone. Throughout spring, an army of snail snatchers scours the countryside, grabbing gastropods. It's not hard to catch a snail. It takes a snail 45 minutes to cover the distance of one human stride. Plus, you can sneak up on them because they're deaf. I said they're deaf. A pro picker can harvest almost a thousand snails a day. Then it's a race to get them into a Frenchman as quickly as possible. Snails might move slowly, but they breed fast. The reason is this, they're hermaphrodites. They have both sex organs. When they breed, they both get pregnant. Less than 24 hours after they've been bagged, the snails arrive at Sadiq's factory in the village of Kadagermany. At peak time in spring, the plant can process over 300,000 fresh snails a day. 90% arrive during that period. But to guarantee fresh-tasting snails all year round, Sadiq puts some on ice. Chilled to minus 20, the shell-shocked snails slip off to that great vegetable patch in the sky, which is deemed the most humane way to dispatch a snail. Nowadays, eating snails is a delicacy you find in a posh restaurant. But cavemen used to eat snails. Shells have been found around prehistoric campfires that date back 30,000 years. Every day, seven or eight tonnes of previously frozen snails are processed. A toasty 40-degree bath cleans and defrosts the snails. Then they're sorted by size using a purpose-built machine Sadiq designed himself. A rotating steel cylinder carries snails forward until they fall through the correct size hole. The benefit of this contraption is it can grade over 33,000 snails an hour. They vary from three to five centimetres across. The biggest snail in the world is the African giant, and the biggest one ever found was 39 centimetres long. 
That's more than 15 inches. Imagine eating that with some garlic butter. The snails are nearly ready to be cooked. But first, their meat must be separated from the shells. A conveyor belt carries a stream of snails to a team of workers who pick out the meat. While their vacated homes are sent out back to be sold to chefs who use the shells to serve the slimy hors d'oeuvres. Without shells, the snails are sluggish, but the process runs like lightning as water ferries meat to the end of the line. The next issue is snail intestine contains partially digested leaves, toxins and dirt. Even the French won't eat that. Enter the snail snippers. With surgical precision, they cut away the intestine from 50,000 snails a day. The intestine extends into the snail's coils, back down through the body and into the anus. Snails eat mostly plants. There are some who are predatory carnivores, but they have to feed on things that are even slower than they are, which mostly means other snails. Relieved of their inedible offcuts by the fastest blades in town, the slimy snail fillets get a spin in this clever washing machine. Then they add a bit more than a pinch of salt and they're ready to cook. And naturally, it happens at a snail's pace. Etleri ortalama 20-25 dakika 100 santigrat derecede pişiriyoruz. Bu bir yarı mamuldür. Bundan sonra Avrupa'yı ihracat ettiğimiz zaman Avrupa'da verdiğimiz firmalar bunu 3-3,5 saat kaynataraktan dolma haline getiriyorlar. You can do a lot with snails. Grill them, bake them, fry them, shells on, shells off. The French add garlic, the Bulgarians add paprika. Some people even eat snails eggs like caviar. Fancy. Once cooled, Sadiq snails are packed up and frozen, ready for the trip to France. They're loaded into boxes 20 kilos at a time. Packed, wrapped and stacked, this batch is ready to roll. Sadiq's factory exports 1,500 tonnes every year. And the latest snail trail across Europe is about to begin. Ready, steady, escargot. Still to come, cutlery born in a blazing inferno. And the kayak that's a fish's worst nightmare. How do they do it? You gonna mug me? I might gotta mug you. It's that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run a decent marathon. Thank you very much. Download Veely now. In the old days, forking out on cutlery meant a trip to these guys. Today, it's a very different story. The tale of tableware is an epic that takes in the South African veldt, the industrial heartlands of Germany, and a place where they really know their food, Italy. How do they do it? the plains of South Africa. They like things big here. Big animals and big mines. At this one, near the town of Steelport, they mine the chromium ore chromite to get hold of a key ingredient in cutlery. If we made cutlery out of steel, it would taste weird and it would go rusty. So we need to make it stainless. And we do this by adding chromium. The world's biggest chromite mines are found in South Africa. To get at the chromite, miners first need to loosen it from a solid rock wall, 400 metres below the surface. You find chromium in loads of places that you wouldn't expect to find it. Yellow taxis, school buses, road markings. The thing they use to make the paint yellow is chromium. In the time it takes to say boom, 320 tonnes of rock is turned to rubble. The recovered ore is sent to the surface where it's cleaned and cooked with coke. 
During the process, oxygen leaves the ore and recombines with the coke, leaving shiny lumps of ferrochrome. The finished ferrochrome leaves the big mine for somewhere even bigger. This monster steel mill in the German town of Witten. They make 145,000 tonnes of steel a year. But liquefying the equivalent of three steel Titanics takes a Titanic furnace. This Titanic furnace. If you think your electricity bill is big, spare a thought for these guys. This one furnace uses more power than a town's 100,000 inhabitants combined. The furnace is like an oversized witch's cauldron. But they skip the eye of Newt and add nickel, carbon and the ferrochrome to the mix. This magically turns rusty scrap into high-grade stainless steel. Much of this ferrochrome is the chromium that makes the steel stainless. The chromium combines with the oxygen in the air and it forms this thin protective layer on the surface of the metal. This effectively seals the steel, preventing air and water from getting into contact with it because that's the stuff that would make it rust. The stainless steel is ready for casting. But carrying a giant cauldron full of superheated metal across the factory floor is massively dangerous no matter how much tinfoil you wear. Watched by these Cybermen, the liquid steel is poured into a machine called a vertical continuous caster. At the bottom, the radiating stainless steel is sliced into giant red blocks. They're a bit big to make cutlery with. It's up to the steelman to smash them down to size. If you're thinking, that sounds like fun. That's because it is. Once the operator has completed his heavy metal handiwork, the rods pass through rollers, emerging like strands of superheated metal spaghetti. Next, the stretched red-hot steel is placed on sets of rotating teeth and allowed to cool. If you want to use your smartphone in the cold, you'll need some touchscreen gloves, and they're made from stainless steel thread. The thread carries an electrical current through the glove, so your finger and the screen complete a circuit. More than 41 million tonnes of stainless steel is produced worldwide every year. And 700 tonnes is delivered to this factory in Lumizzane, Italy. They've been making kitchenware here for nearly 70 years. On the menu this morning, a new batch of forks. Knives can be made on a blacksmith's anvil, and we've been using them to eat with for millennia. Forks are trickier, which is why they're a more recent invention. To kick off the process, they feed a one-ton roll of stainless steel into a cutout press. This smashes out steel blanks like a 15-ton tungsten-tipped cookie cutter. The blanks are transferred by robot into a rolling machine and then into a second low-pressure press. This pushes the blanks onto a mould of hardened blades and slices out prongs at a rate of 4,000 per hour. The presses leave behind tiny shards of steel that could ruin your rump steak and your teeth. These are removed with polishing machines, then they're cleaned in a massive industrial washer. Now the forks are clean, but they're flat. A big problem unless you want to eat your peas one at a time. So this press forces the metal between two curved die, bending the prongs into the familiar fork shape. Here's an amazing fact for you. Using cutlery has actually changed the shape of our face. Before cutlery, we used to rip food with our teeth, and our teeth were lined like a monkey's, like this. Since using cutlery, 
Our jaw has moved back and our teeth now overlap. Finally, the cutlery is polished with a series of brushes and abrasive paste, transforming the rough flatware into forks fit for a five-star restaurant. The one place they probably won't end up in is in the city of Gainesville in Georgia, USA. It's illegal to use a fork there, but only when eating fried chicken. No, I've got no idea why either. The world is hooked on fishing. But trying to catch your fish supper in a big pair of waders can leave you floundering. This could be the answer. Part kayak, part penguin. It gives you the opportunity to sneak up on your prey and have a whale of a time doing it. But building this so fish bit of kit takes some serious engineering muscle. All these fishing puns are giving me a haddock. How do they do it? Oceanside, California is a city with a proud seafaring history. So it's a natural home for a company like Hobie Cat. They started out in the 1950s making surfboards. But today, they're working on something a little bit different. And it all starts with these giant cardboard boxes. Each holds something that looks like cornmeal, but is in fact powdered polyethylene. The man with his hands full is head of manufacturing, Rich Gleason. Powder is everything, because that's the basis for the, the whole kayak. Around 90 million tons of polyethylene is made every year. But this batch has been specially formulated for making kayaks. But compounded, so you get the color pigments put into it, you get uh, some UV inhibitors in it to make it last longer in the sun, because all of our products will be outdoors, so we want to make sure it lasts for years. Without the UV inhibitors embedded in the plastic, the finished kayak's colour would fade in the sun like a pair of old jeans. It's a well-known fact that UV light from the sun bleaches out colour. But it's not just on Earth. With no atmosphere to protect them, anything that might be left of the flags planted on the moon will now be completely white. The kayak construction process begins with cleaning out this mould. Precise amounts of the polyethylene powder are then poured in. The challenge now is turning the granules into something that will float. So the top half of the mould is lowered into place and sealed, before the whole caboodle is hoisted into this giant mouth-shaped oven. As the jaws close, this worker fires up three burners hidden inside, which heat the mould to over 300 degrees Celsius. The trouble is that as the plastic melts, it turns into a liquid and starts to sink to the bottom of the mould. So like some kind of flight simulator, the whole thing is tilted back and forth, while inside, the mould is spun around like a gyroscope. You need to rotate, you need a constant motion so that the plastic is tumbling inside of the mould surface. If you don't tilt it, then the ends won't have enough plastic. The stern and bow need to be thick to protect against impacts while the deck needs to be thinner to save on weight. This is achieved by adjusting the temperature of each burner so that it melts and cools different thicknesses of plastic in different parts of the kayak. So if we want more plastic, we might heat up one end, maybe 600 degrees in the, the stern, or we want more plastic, we got 550 in the middle and maybe 575 in the, the other end. And so that way, if you get more heat, you get more plastic. Around 45 minutes later, the hot mould can be lifted out and placed onto this rack. Here, it's blasted with cooling air. But this chilling makes the plastic contract. To compensate, the hulls are made to 104% of their final dimensions. So by the time they've completely cooled, they've shrunk to the perfect size. The problem for these guys is that this hull can still sag under the force of gravity. 
so compressed air is pumped into the hollow hull to provide it with internal pressure. The finished hull is then moved to the assembly section. Here, cleats for lines are added, followed by the rudder. This is connected via cables to a couple of handles, which turn the rudder with the flick of the wrist. But steering is useless unless you're moving forward. With traditional kayaks, your hands are busier paddling when they could be a fishing. So engineer Greg Ketterman went underwater in search of a solution and came up with the pedal-powered Mirage Drive. Almost all mammals or fish in nature, they all do the same kind of motion. It's probably most similar to a penguin. A penguin's wings or a turtle, it moves its flippers like this. And that's exactly what the Mirage Drive does. The Mirage Drive uses a system of pulleys and cables to turn the backwards and forwards motion of the pedals into the side-to-side -side sweep of the fins. Because the fins are twice the size of a normal paddle, you move twice as far with each pedal stroke. Penguins and turtles are obviously great swimmers, but the most efficient swimmer is, in fact, the jellyfish. They swim with this natural contract and relax motion, which allows them to recapture some of the energy they spend on moving. They spend less energy traveling than any other swimming creature. Below the water, the flexibility of the rubber fins is key to the success of the drive system. If the fin was rigid and it didn't flex, you just have a flat plate just trying to push itself through the water, and most likely it wouldn't produce any thrust at all. The Mirage Drive is inserted into the middle of the kayak's deck and secured. And once the seat has been installed, the completed kayak is ready to hit the waves. So hopefully, the one that got away last time won't get away this time.